So um, I've been reading uh, my, I have my new book, The Ghosts Who Travel With Me, just came out in June. So I've been reading from it um, various places. And um, it took me a long time to figure out what it was about as I was writing it and even when I was done writing it. But I have come to decide that it's about literal and literary ancestors. So it's the people and the places who have made us who we are. So I'm going to get us, uh, it's also a, a road trip memoir. So I'm going to get us on the road with a very short chapter of uh, where the book begins. It's a long, slow drive. Why Idaho? The baristas set cups on saucers, and next to them, tiny silver spoons. I said, why not Idaho? My partner Arlene and I planned to drive from Seattle to Boise in one day a journey that MapQuest said would take eight hours and 23 minutes. We had dropped our black lab off with my parents and stopped at a coffee house on our way out of town. The barista told us in a confessional rush that she was fifth generation Idaho. Her father had been in the legislature, so she had lived half the year in Hope and half the year in Boise. Did we know where Coeur d'Alene was? I did, and north of that sand point, if we went east from there, we'd get to Hope, a little town. We weren't going to Coeur d'Alene, I said, or anywhere in northern Idaho. We were going to Boise and then up into the Sawtooth Mountains. I didn't say we were on a literary pilgrimage. She made perfect cream tulips on the surface of our coffee. She said, don't worry about Aryan nations. <laughs> she slid the cups across the counter. It's better now. Believe me, I was a little dyke. I stole the next door neighbor's wife. And they didn't do anything. <laughs> oh, they drove down our driveway one night, took a long, slow drive by our house. But that's all. <laughs> Arlene and I took our dyke selves back to the car. <laughs> I brushed scone crumbs off my shirt. Arlene said, she doesn't live in Idaho anymore. She lives here. It's just for a week, I said. One week in Idaho. I got on Interstate 90 and headed east. <laughs> so that gets us on the road. So um, the literary pilgrimage part is about a writer named Richard Brodigan, who was very popular in the 60s and 70s in particular. He had a book called Trout Fishing in America that's this kind of nonlinear, psychedelic novel. Uh, but part of it's about a trip he took through Idaho in 1961 with his wife and baby daughter. and. Um, I was obsessed with his work when I was an adolescent. So when I reread Trout Fishing in America in my mid-40s, I was like, what was that all about? Right? Who was that 13-year-old, that 14-year-old that was obsessed with him? Why him? So I decided I was going to do a little literary pilgrimage and find the places, some of the places he went in Idaho, including his campsite. So, um, so, I did, so that's part of the book. Um, but part of the book is also, so I, I, I developed this idea of like, as a writer, he was a, a literary ancestor to me, but also how are some of my ancestors, biological ancestors, created me the way I am. And since this is, tonight's about nourishment, so I, I thought I would read this one, which is about my grandmother. Um, so Brodigan's book's called Trout Fishing in America, so I thought the female version was Trout Frying in America. <laughs> so that's the title of this chapter. My maternal grandmother, born in a sod house on the South Dakota prairie and raised in Montana, made sourdough pancakes with starter that had been kept alive in a mason jar for generations. Women kept on feeding it and feeding it and passing it along to their daughters, and I was the lucky child in the late 60s who stood nose to counter and watched my grandmother pour in this and sift in that and stir briskly with a wooden spoon, and ladle onto the griddle, and flip when the bubbles rose to the top. I like to imagine I spread my sourdough pancakes with butter and Vermont maple syrup. But actually, I knifed a big chunk of margarine out of the tub and onto my pancakes, and followed this with syrup out of the plastic Aunt Jemima bottle. This was when Aunt Jemima wore that kerchief and made white America comfortable. My grandmother could make biscuits on the counter with no recipe and no bowl. She sifted flour and baking soda and salt into a pile, cut in the butter with a knife and fork, made a depression in the top for the eggs and milk, 
stirred them in, kneaded quickly, and cut out biscuits with the mouth of a tumbler. As we grandchildren grew older, we said, Grandma, what's your recipe? A little of this, a little of that, till it looks right. The men folk cleaned the fish, and the women folk fried them. Although both men and women may have used frying pans on wood fires, frying pans on stoves were the tools of women. Trout were dredged in flour or cornmeal and fried, heads off or heads on, until the flesh left its state of translucence and turned opaque. Women knew, without knowing the name for it, that the muscles of fish are held together by collagen that dissolves quickly in the heat, leaving only the muscle fibers. Those fibers turn from pearly to tough in the time it takes to slide a paring knife under the trout's skin. The sourdough starter was lost to me. I chose, upon my grandmother's death, a white glass chicken with a red waddle that she kept filled with pink and white mints. It doesn't replace her pancakes or her biscuits or her trout trembling on the edge of translucency. It doesn't replace her hands and wrists moving through flour as sure as any trout through a stream. Thank you. So in keeping with the themes of travel and ancestry that are in Allison's book, um, I those are also things I'm really interested in um, in some of the poems from my new collection of poetry, The Multitude. Um, it's new in the sense that it's going to be newly published on December 1st. I'm really excited. But also, these are poems I've been working on f sort of over the course of the last 10 years. So some of them are like, I wrote it seven years ago, and I look at that, and I go, ooh, do I still like that? And for all these, the answer is yes, so that's good. Um, <laughs> the um, I'm going to start with two poems. Um, on the travel theme, they, the multitude in, in the title is kind of a multitude of different worlds that we inhabit and we kind of travel back and forth. Some are real, some are imaginary. Um, and so this first poem is set in the Star Wars universe and the second one is set in the real world, sort of. Um, and I would say this first poem is inspired by the muse of the modern poet, which is Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> It's titled Endor, Disambiguation. And I also have to give a shout out to Nicole Hardy who helped me with the last line of this poem. She's here. In a hut in the Star Wars universe on the forest moon of Endor, a creature carefully draws a map of things connected to other things. The creature draws a road between two worlds because one elvish name for Tolkien's Middle Earth is also this forest moon, or the planet the forest moon orbits. On this point, the Star Wars universe is unclear. Maybe our universe has a finite number of times you can summon the dead, so we've begun to repeat ourselves. Endor, ancient Canaanite village, home of the witch who conjured Samuel. Endor, Palestinian village depopulated. Endor, Israeli kibbutz. Endor, the most successful town in Dragon Quest IV, Chapters of the Chosen. So, who can blame the Israelite king for wanting his best prophet back from the land of the dead? Who can blame the witch who only did what was asked of her? Endor, forest moon, home place. There were so many worlds I longed to visit as a child, where the creatures, the citizens, would line up along the street to say, welcome friend, welcome stranger. And the second poem comes from the first year I moved to Seattle. I had a writing fellowship, so I had lots of time. And um, it was 2008, which was, um, right when I, the month I moved here was the month the economy crashed. So it was very, I was very obsessed with the weirdness of like there was hills and water everywhere because I just moved from Indiana where it was flat and there was no water. That was really weird and then the economy was crashing and that was really weird. And I had a weird obsession with the Virgin Mary. So this poem <laughs> is called um, The Virgin in the City. 
and kind of brings those things together. If she were out of work, she'd ride the bus all day, just knitting, sitting in the dark knuckle between bus halves, lulled by accordion folds. She likes the smell of worn out men, stale smoke, damp boots, and salt. It makes her feel useful, wanted. Her work is walking library stacks, and where her fingers trail frayed spines, worn threads reweave themselves under her footprints. Marble floors regain their gleam. She hovers in the reading room, smelling the sour breath of strangers, for whatever she smells turns holy in her nose. She sounds out syllables with jittery students, turn pages for the tired, and when they nod, she blesses their exhausted sleep. Outdoors, she opens empty freight containers, carries wood to trash can fires, draws water from the wind and air, and pricks the Snowden city's sickened heart, an egg she broods over, warming it at her breast. And just before dawn, she alights in the museum lobby, trips the neon switch to glow in its warm buzz of sin. The angel is waiting. The child has slept, but must be fed. So, trailing her shawl behind her, she walks the labyrinth home. Mm -hmm.